Welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2020 webinar on broadleaf and grass weed control in pulses. My name is Claire and I work with Birchip Cropping Group. I coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability. The purpose of today's webinar is to give an overview of new chemistry options in pulses, managing rotations and grass weed control. Now, before we start the webinar, everybody should be muted. We will take questions after the presentation and the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen allows you to ask questions. So if you see a button for Q&A, if you click that, open the window, type your question into the box and hit send. You can also check send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to your question. This webinar is also being recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, or if you have any technical issues or you would like to share this, the recordings will be made available on the GRDC YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Now, let's get straight into today's presentation. I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Chris Preston, who is a professor of weed management at the University of Adelaide, working on the understanding and management of herbicide resistant weeds. He is a winner of GRDC's Seed of Light Award for Research Communication. Over to you, Chris. Well, thank you, Claire. And uh, what I want to do this afternoon is to talk uh, briefly about some of the uh, problems and issues we have with weed management in pulse crops. Um, I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, immunoresistant pulses and how they might fit in the system and some of the issues that we're starting to see in South Australia around those uh, crops. And I'll finally uh, finish off with some comments about some new chemistry that's coming for weed control in pulses um, that uh, might be of use into the future and where I see this chemistry perhaps having its best fit. So to start off with, I think, you know, just thinking about the challenges we have with weed management in pulses and probably the biggest challenge is that pulses tend to be poorly competitive against weeds compared to cereals. It's not so much necessarily um, in the early part of the growing season. A lot of our problems really arise once the canopy starts to open late in the season and any weeds that sit under that canopy can just uh, grow ahead and produce a lot of seed. And coupled with that, we have limited herbicide options for pulses for controlling uh, many of our weeds. And of those limited options that we do have, many of the herbicides, particularly the ones that we tend to use against broadleaf weeds, can be damaging to pulses. And so we have quite a restricted uh, range of products and race that we can use and often if we do get weed control, we might end up with some crop damage and, and that's not good in a crop that's not that competitive to start with. And finally, herbicide resistance as an issue is increasing in a lot of our key weeds. And that's certainly something that we need to be uh, cognizant of going uh, further, going into the future around the herbicides that we're using in our pulse crops. <clears throat> um, Immu resistance can provide a solution. And at the moment we have both lentils and faba beans that have um, immu resistance, so we can put Intervix over. And they provide control of many of the problematic uh, broadleaf weeds and indeed grasses uh, in pulse crops. And uh, Intervix is, is still the best herbicide we have for control of brome grass, for example. So these certainly um, options that we've obtained in the last um, few years and can change the way that we can manage some of those difficult to manage pulse crops. But the problem we've got is that resistance to the immunes is increasing. Uh, this is some data from uh, random surveys that were conducted in the southeastern part of Australia between 2013 and 2017. 
And so these were surveys that would collect the remaining weeds out of farmers' fields at the end of the season and just tested them in this case uh, against Itavix. And I've, only, I've got three weeds here. I didn't put ryegrass on because most of the ryegrass is actually resistant to um, Itavix. But I think that there's some real signals here that we're, we're starting to run into some issues. Um, you know, New South Wales was still pretty good in terms of broadleaf weeds with resistance, but a little bit of brome with resistance to Itavix was uh, occurring there. Uh, we know we have brome with resistance to Itavix in both Victoria and South Australia, uh, but we didn't pick it up in our surveys. But in South Australia, a quarter of the wild radish had resistance to Itavix and 13% of Indian hedge mustard. And where you go to Tasmania, they've actually got even more resistance to Itavix in wild radish. So of these weeds that we were surveying at that time, we're already starting to see resistance to the IMI herbicides increasing. So while the IMIs have provided us a really valuable new tool for managing some of these troublesome weeds in our pulses, what's happened is that the weeds have fairly quickly got resistance to those herbicides. So when we think about how we're gonna use those IMI herbicides into the future, we really need to be thinking about how do we set up a cropping system where we don't overuse this particular piece of chemistry so that we still can use it against the weeds that we need to tackle? Very recently, we've conducted some surveys in um, South Australia on the Mid North and York Peninsula, uh, essentially around the um, more intensive lentil growing areas in South Australia. One of the things that we were starting to see was a lot of uh, surviving weeds in lentil crops, particularly at the end of the season. And farmers were really struggling to control those weeds um, to the point of having to use uh, things like Paraquat Plus Sharpen uh, late in the season to burn down the weeds so that they could harvest. And what we found when we sampled was that the number of samples that we collected out of farmers' paddocks that were resistant, virtually all of the prickly lettuce we collected was resistant to the IMI herbicides and a little over half of the south thistle. There wasn't a whole lot of difference between the Mid-North and York Peninsula in terms of how much resistance they had. Uh, so a lot of this is really being driven by the increased amount of Indivix being used in the cropping rotations in those areas. And lentil in particular are helping to drive that because there aren't a lot of other choices in terms of managing prickly lettuce and, and sow thistle in lentil crops. And so Indivix was really being relied on there. We've seen prickly lettuce move a bit faster than sow thistle. Uh, and that's to do with the uh, the biology and genetics of the two weed species. Um, prickly lettuce requires a single mutation to get resistance. Um, South thistle, we have to have two. But what's happened is that in a short period of around about a decade, we've moved from these weeds being resistant to the sulfonyl ureas, but mostly susceptible to intervix, to being resistant to both intervix and the sulfonyl ureas. And so they're gonna be some challenging weeds for us to have to manage into the future. And I would certainly expect that in areas where a lot of the IMI resistant lentils have been grown, that we'll be starting to see these same two weeds appearing with resistance to that chemistry. So that's the resistance side of things. So we do have some challenges there around resistance and we have some real challenges around other aspects of um, pulse production. I'm gonna switch gears now and actually talk about ryegrass because pulses have been one of the mainstays for us in terms of managing herbicide resistant ryegrass, which we struggle to man manage in our cereals, but pulses have been very good because we've had lots of tools. And what I want to do is I just want to talk about 
just one trial that we had at uh, uh, Francis a few years ago, um, 2016, where we're looking at ryegrass management in, in faba beans and looking at just some, sometimes some relatively small changes in practice and what that did in terms of, of management. So the way we set this trial up, we had a, a number of different management strategies. I've only got the, the low and the high here. Um, and the low management strategy was, um, you know, a relatively weak grass pre-emergent um, program of, of simazine and box of gold, and then a post-emergent um, select plus factor. Um, so going pretty hard in that post-emergent space. And that was all that was done. In the uh, high intensity management strategy, we swapped out the box of gold for uh, propizomide, um, had the same select plus factor, and then just had that um, post glyphosate crop top. Now, the post glyphosate crop top would have made no difference to the ryegrass populations or the amount of seed heads we had in that year. That was really going to influence what was going to happen in the next year. So we'll leave that one out. And here we're really just comparing having a more effective pre-emergent herbicide strategy compared to a less effective pre-emergent herbicide strategy. And that's only really about the persistence of the chemistry we're using. So propizomide's a lot more persist persistent in the environment than box of gold is. So we get control later into the crop. And the results were that just by having that extra pre-emergent herbicide up front, we halved the number of ryegrass plants and about half the number of ryegrass seed heads they had. And that actually had a, a significant impact on yield as well. So I think the, the lessons we want to take away from this is to be thinking about how we're putting together the program we're using for managing our weeds in pulse crops. And it's not just about what we're doing in the pulse phase, but it's also about what we're doing in the rotation. So for grass weeds, we're going to manage them in the pulses. For broadleaf weeds, we're going to manage them in the cereal part of the rotation. But by simply having a, a good, effective pre-emergent herbicide strategy, you can have quite a big impact on weed seed set at the end of the season, simply because you don't have those weeds growing from the start. And so all the weeds you have that are, or most of the weeds you have that are growing, have come up later in the crop. They haven't been as competitive and you get your yield benefit out of that. And they don't end up setting as much seed. And it also works that if you're doing any sort of harvest weed seed control, including things like crop topping, they're much more effective on smaller weed populations than they are on larger weed populations. So one of the things that we probably had a tendency to do in our pulse phase is to concentrate on post-emergent herbicides like uh, uh, Select as being the main um, grass weed control we did. But in fact, these pre-emergent herbicides can really provide us with a lot of value in terms of getting good weed control. And not only that, but we actually pick up that benefit at the end of the season and through the rotation. So I think that when we start to think about how we're going to do weed management across our rotation, we really need to be focusing on our troublesome weed species. And a lot of our researchers determined that if we can do three things to, to manage weeds each season, then we are eventually going to get on top of those particular weeds. So here we've got a pre-emergent herbicide, a post-emergent herbicide and crop topping, but it doesn't have to be that. Um, in wheat, we've done it with a pre-emergent herbicide and crop competition. So, you know, you can do different things in different crops, but we need to be aiming for that three tactics. And I really feel the same is true for broadleaf weeds as well. We don't have as much data on um, these sort of trials with broadleaf weeds, but where we have gone and looked at, say, wild radish management, for example, uh, what we found is that a, 
uh, a two spray approach in wheat, an early spray with a contact product and a later sprayed with a, uh, a more uh, systemic product and then crop competition is often enough to actually manage wild radish. So there are lots of opportunities. It's about making sure we take advantage of using those opportunities in the rotation. And so here I want to talk about, you know, the really in, the importance of rotations and, and part of the trouble that we're starting to see in South Australia is pulse crops that look like this um, at harvest, where the crops dried off nicely, but it's actually full of green weeds. And this is being driven primarily due to too many pulse crops in the rotation. So areas on the um, York Peninsula where lentils have been extremely profitable, we've seen lentils on lentil um, rotations, um, we've even a lot of tight rotations, wheat lentils, wheat lentils, and it just doesn't really give you enough opportunity to drive the weed numbers down if you're growing pulses all the time. So some of it's about getting the rotation right, making sure that there are uh, cereal crops in that rotation and that when the cereal crops are there, you do actually get really good control of these troublesome weeds. And so rotations are part of the, the key of how we're going to manage these weeds going forward. Um, you know, the weeds in this paddock, are, they're both resistant to, um, in fact, all three weeds that are in there, because um, there's some uh, Indian heads mustard in there as well, they'll all be resistant to emi herbicides. So we can't just rely on the emi herbicides in the pulse to control these weeds. We have to get the rotation right as well. And so um, I did promise Claire that this was going to be a relatively short presentation so they would have a lot of time for questions. And I'm sure there are going to be plenty of questions about this component of it. But we do actually have some new herbicides for pulses coming. Uh, pulses, part of the problem we have with pulses, they're relatively small crop. We don't necessarily get lots of new herbicides. And, and often the herbicides that do come are troublesome to use. But we've got some a couple of uh, real opportunities coming, uh, one of which is Ultro, which is a Group E herbicide from Adama. Um, it's a bit of a born again herbicide. Um, well, actually both of these are born again herbicides if you like, um, but we had carbetamide in Australia in the um, 1980s and early 1990s, and then it, it disappeared. And this um, does provide us some pretty good pre-emergent grass weed control. Uh, in terms of the grass weeds, it's probably best on brome. Um, it's good on barley grass, uh, pretty good on rye grass, though in really thick rye grass uh, infestations, you really want to top this up with something else as well. So go for a, a, a two pre-emergent herbicide strategy there. Probably the um, biggest issue we're likely to see with this herbicide in the short term is that when it was in Australia in the 80s and 90s, it was being very widely used for ryegrass control in the pasture seed industry. And we developed microbes in the soil that broke it down really quickly. So instead of getting you know, four or five weeks of control of weeds, it only lasted three or four days. And that was essentially why we lost it. Now, those bugs are still out there. So we need to be really careful in, in areas where uh, there's been uh, white clover seed production in the past, for example. So that part of South Australia that was growing white clover seed, they need to be really careful about how often they use these, this herbicide. It'll work really good the first time, but that'll bump up the um, population of bugs to break it down. And so if you come in too soon afterwards, it won't work as well. So you probably need it once every four years in that sort of situation. On the um, cereal side, uh, we have Reflex, which is a Group G herbicide from Syngenta. Uh, this is actually another old or older active ingredient, but not one that we've had in Australia. It's called Fomasafen. And this acts a lot like um, quite a number of the Group G herbicides that we are familiar with. Only it's a little bit more mobile in the soil 
than say um, terrain is. And what this is going to do will provide us with a new tool for some pre-emergent broadleaf weed control in pulse crops. It, unlike terrain, we'll be able to use this across the pulse um, suite of pulse crops. Lentils are going to be the most susceptible of those pulse crops. So uh, care is going to be, need to be taken with lentils, uh, particularly to make sure that herbicide doesn't go back into the crop row. But this particular product is very good on brassicas and on the thistle family. So this will help us in our pulse rotation with managing our imi resistant sour thistle and prickly lettuce. So 2021, we'll have these two new um, products available. They will find a nice fit in our pulse rotations uh, because they'll be able to help control weeds that we're um, finding a bit challenging in that situation. And um, that will then, I think, let us sort of work on the rest of the rotation and the other um, tactics that we have to have in place. So we're looking for pre-emergent herbicides in front of our pulses. We want to have, still probably be using our select and select factor for ryegrass. Um, whatever um, post-emergent herbicides that we might have available for some of our broadleaf weeds. And then coming back with some uh, weed management at the end of the season, whether that's crop topping or whether it's some harvest weed seed control. Um, and I think that that'll then help us get on top of the weeds in the pulses. And we need to be doing a similar sort of thing in the cereal phase. So that's what I was uh, wanting to, to try and cover um, in, the, uh, in the presentation. Just some thoughts about where we've been, some of the problems we've had, and perhaps what some of the solutions uh, might, uh, might look like. And so at that, I'm happy to uh, take on some questions. Um, do we have any questions, Claire? Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, that was fantastic. If you would like to ask Chris a question, then please type it into the, the Q&A box, the buttons down the, the bottom of your screen, and you can type it in there. Um, right now, we don't have any questions uh, from the participants, Chris. But I'm sure be some. Um, I've got one for you, Chris, in the meantime, with the increase in um, imi tolerant crops being grown, what's your strategy for managing to try and keep on top of and preventing uh, imi resistance coming into your farming system? Is it rotations or what's, yeah, what's your strategy? Yeah, look, I think clear rotations is going to be an important part of that. And I think that the way we need to think about immune tolerant crops in the future is that they're not all of them going to be in our farming system to allow us to use immies in that crop. A lot of the time we're going to be growing these crops to manage residues that we had in the soil, such as at the beginning of this season, um, where, you know, when we have those spring droughts, it's really challenging for us to get enough rainfall to break those residues down. So that's that's part of their role. And I think this is going to be a case of, of you know, individual paddock problems. So one of the things that we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about how to use these crops is what is the main weed problem that I need to be tackling with the IMI herbicide? And that then defines when should I be using it? So should I be using it in my pulse crops if I'm tackling brown grass? And I think my answer to that is that, no, you probably shouldn't be using it in your pulse crop to tackle brown grass because we do have some other herbicides that'll do that for us. And so for brown grass, we're probably going to want to be using it in the cereals and not in the pulse part of the rotation. And I think we can go through, you know, all of the weeds that farmers are, are chasing with any herbicides and start making those same decisions. Yes, you know, we need to use it in the pulse crop for this particular weed because uh, that's causing me a problem on this paddock, which means then I'm growing my cereal, my imi cereals for residue management and to 
then use different chemistry there so that when I come out the end, I can grow whatever crop I want and I don't have to necessarily grow a, uh, an immunotolerant crop. And I can choose to go back in if I need to control that weed again with immies or you can do something different. So I think that's where we've got to be. The, the idea that I've planted a, an imi crop and, oh yeah, Innovix is just so easy to use, I'll use Innovix. That's going to lead us to a lot of resistance. You've seen how quickly resistance can happen. Uh, one of the things we know, but we don't understand why, uh, we've got, we got some ideas, is that some weeds get resistant a lot faster than the immies than others. So I pointed out the prickly lettuce, for example, that has shifted very quickly. So there might be some weeds like brome where we can use it a little bit more often, um, but others like prickly lettuce where we're just not going to get that opportunity. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Chris. Now, two questions have uh, jumped in in the meantime. So the first one, is the risk of crop damage with select plus factor as high in pulses as what can be seen in canola? Uh, the short answer to that question is no. Pulses are actually a lot more tolerant to both of these herbicides. And so when we're designing our integrated management plans these days, we often don't put factor in the canola phase. Um, or if we do, we'll wind the rate of select back as well. So we'll do something like 300 mils of select and then add the factor. Uh, but when we go to the, um, the pulse phase, we go at the top rate of both of them, um, simply because the pulse crops are so much more tolerant to these herbicides. You can't go late. You still need to be putting that out pretty early uh, in the crop, um, but you do have a lot more tolerance in pulse crops. And so it gives you the opportunity to go to the top end of the label of both the products. We find Factor works better on small ryegrass plants, um, but we just always loathe to put it out alone because if you've got anything with any size, you really need the clethidine component. When, what's late, Chris, when you say you can't go late, what would you define as late in pulses? Oh, well, I think you need to, you ne really need to have these, these herbicides out um, early before you're getting canopy closure is the, is the ideal time. I mean, factors really good on three leaf ryegrass and activity falls away significantly once that ryegrass starts to tiller. So the old fashioned, you know, way we've learnt to use clethodim because we could, of going out and putting it out on big tillered ryegrass and killing them, you won't get factor to work that way. So you really want to get factor out when uh, ryegrass is at three leaf stage, just starting to tiller. Excellent, thanks Chris. The next question is chickpeas uh, with balance and sakura. Uh, for weed control? That was all that was on the question. Okay. Yeah, yeah look, chickpeas. control, yes. Yeah, chickpeas offer us a, a new um, uh, opportunity. Hang on. We've got a bit more. Does Boxer Gold and Sakura have the same risk to chickpeas, faba beans, peas as wheat does? Okay. So, um, yes, yeah, so the issue about Boxer Gold and Sakura is that the um, pulse crops have got different levels of tolerance to these and they're almost opposite. So um, without pulling up all the labels um, to give you the exact uh, numbers, but you don't use, um, if I'll get this right, you don't use Sakura in Faber beans. Um, oh, I'm not sure if that's correct. Anyway, you can look at the labels, but one of the things you'll see about the labels is that they're almost opposite in terms of their tolerance, um, the various um, pulses. So you, you would pick the product for that crop because it's safer in that crop. Um, but I think that overall, one of the things that we're seeing about Box of Gold is we're seeing quite a bit of resistance turning up. And so even though we used it in our Faber trial, um, it's not a, a product I would recommend for us to use in the pulse phase. I think we need to probably keep that for the cereal phase. Uh, 
because in the pulse phase, we've got propizomide. And the propizomide label or the edge label gives you a higher rate than you would, norm you would be used to using in canola. And that gives you a bit longer um, grass weed control. And the other good thing about um, propizomide is we don't actually have a lot of resistance in ryegrass. So it's quite persistent. It's really well suited for the pulse phase in the rotation. Okay. Thank you, Chris. We've got one more um, question. The, the field, field use rate of clethodim has been generally been above 500 mils per hectare. Has there been any work to increase this label rate and how does the addition of factor compare to one litre per hectare for clethodim? Okay, so the, um, the rate has been increased for pulses, not canola, because it's not safe in canola, um, but it's been increased for pulses on the edge label. And I know because some of our data went into, into that submission, because we've been doing some, some trial work, we've been looking at um, different rates and different mixtures. Um, so the higher rate will control more of the ryegrass and it will suppress more of the ryegrass. And certainly if you use it early, you will find that even ryegrass that's resistant can be controlled. So you have both a, a plant size and a rate effect with clethodim. So the bigger the plants, the more rate you need to control them. Um, and with resistance, you need more rate again. So we would still find that the um, select plus factor used at the ideal time, so at that early timing, um, is probably better on clethodim resistant ryegrass populations than any rate of clethodim. If you're wanting to go later in the crop phase um, to get some tillered ryegrass, well, in pulses, you can, the, the factor won't as do as much for you. Uh, but the higher rate of clethodim will be better then. And it might, mightn't kill the ryegrass, but it will suppress them. And so if that's done just before canopy closure, then you can keep that ryegrass suppressed until the canopy opens at the back end of the season. At that stage, you then got to do something about them because they'll go off and set a lot of seed. So if that's your management plan, you need to be thinking about stopping that ryegrass setting seed. Excellent, thank you, Chris. Um, and just going back to our question previously on the chickpeas. So what effect does balance have on weed control in chickpeas, particularly focusing on wild radish? Well, I mean, balance is a, a group H herbicide and we can only use it in chickpeas. It is quite persistent uh, and that's, a problem that we have when we use it as well in terms of making sure that we're not using it in environments where it's going to carry over to the next crop. So there's some challenges about using it but we certainly have it as an, an option for um, chickpeas and group H herbicides can be quite good as pre-emergence on wild radish. So um, Syngenta this year has registered Callisto for cereals um, for exactly that same sort of use. They're probably not quite as good as picking up the radish um, in crop. So you'll get a little bit of radish will come through later um, out of that. So you do need to have another radish control tactic uh, coming later in the season. And what about um, Sakura on the control of wild radish as well? Well, Sakura is just doesn't really have um, that much um, strength against broadleaf weeds. Uh, it's got a little bit of activity on on smaller seeded brassicas. Um, occasionally, you'll see that where Sakura has gone down in, in trial work that you don't have as much wild radish. It's probably because you've had a little bit of control, but it's nowhere near as good, for example, as it is on grasses. So I wouldn't be relying on Sakura um, for wild radish um, control as a pre-emergent 
in pulses. Um, you need to have a, a, a much more uh, integrated approach. Um, Reflex will give us some opportunity to get, to get some um, wild radish control, but again, it's not going to be uh, really complete um, control right through the season we'll still need to be have to come in and control um, radish that's come up later. So it'll help. Um, reflex will be um, better than um, Sakura. Balance will be better than Sakura um, in that space. Uh, but it's those other practices that are gonna get us on top of those weeds. And uh, we've just had a little comment come in, Chris, that uh, Sakura works on feather top roads grass. Um, and we've got one more question. I know we are over time, but uh, some good discussion here. So Chris, what is the post-emergent uh, for wild radish con control in chickpeas? What is the best option? Uh, well, you've got me there because we don't do a lot of work on chickpeas. Um, <laughs> in South Australia, I didn't actually look up the answer to that question. Um, so I'll look it up and I'll get back. yeah I think I'll look it up and I'll give you I'll send you that one to you um, uh, Claire and you can post that with the with the presentation. Yes, I will um, get back to you with an answer to that question. I do apologise to this person. Are there any more burning questions? Oh, hang on and balance for feather top roads grass. Yeah, look, balance is actually quite good against feather top roads grass um, as a pre emergent. Yep. Okay, very good. Um, okay, well, if there is no more burning questions, we might leave it there. Um, Chris? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I'll follow up the chickpeas. Yes, and we'll get back in touch uh, with you. So thank you very much, Chris. If anyone uh, would like any further information on pulses, the GRDC Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource. Also, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project has a number of activities occurring during 2020 to bring you the latest pulse information. We have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia for existing and new pulse growers. If you have any other suggestions or requests for things that you would like to learn about pulses, please let me know um, via my email address, which is claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, at bcg.org.au. Thank you once again, Chris, for a great presentation. Once you leave this webinar, you will be redirected to a screen with a quick survey link. It has five very short questions which should take you no more than a minute just to see how you found today so we can make future webinars better for you. If you're able to fill that out, that would be much appreciated. This webinar series is a monthly initiative, so the next webinar will be in July. If you'd like to be kept in the loop of these webinars as they occur again, please email myself and I will add you to the distribution list. Thank you very much everyone for attending today and thank you Chris. You're welcome.